Here at Early Excellence, we specialise in early childhood education. We offer expert advice and guidance through training, consultancy and classroom design. With the Early Excellence podcast, we aim to inspire and support you as well as challenge your thinking. So if that's what you're looking for, you've come to the right place. Hello everybody, Andy Burt here. Welcome along to episode 87 of the Early Excellence podcast. In this week's episode, I'm joined by my colleague Luella Ivans as we explore the fantastic possibilities of sand play and how to create an effective sand area in your setting. So here you go. Here's my Early Excellence podcast chat with my colleague Luella Ivans. How are you, Luella? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Andy. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm well. All good. All good. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about sand areas today. Um, wet sand, dry sand, we're going to be talking about the benefits of those areas. Um, and we're also going to unpick, really, sort of some, some key things to consider when we're thinking about the resourcing of sand areas and when we're thinking about, actually, what are the benefits for the children in terms of sand play? Okay, so let's get let's get started with this straight away. Let's go into why is a sand area important? Even before we get into wet or dry sand, why is sand play important? Luella, do you want to kick us off with that? Yeah, uh, you know, I think sands are really interesting. In, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? Because we go in and work with lots of different schools and often we'll see sand provision um, in the early years, um, but in quite an, in quite a lot of schools as well, um, it's missing from the indoor environment, isn't it? Um, but there is so much scope for learning with sand, you know, whether it's wet sand or dry sand, but it offers lots of learning possibilities, I think. Um, exploration, kind of curiosity, looking closely, you know, getting those opportunities for children to delve into like similarities and differences as well. Um, and really get into grips with new vocabulary, opportunities for talk as well. Um, there's a whole host of things. I think some of the obvious things when we think about sand is we naturally gravitate to things like maths, don't we? Um and yeah, there's absolutely loads of opportunities for maths in a sand area, loads. Um, you know, they can kind of group, sort, count, do all those sorts of things, measuring. But it, I think it goes far beyond that. And it's making sure that those connections are clear to us as teachers, I think. Um, what is it that that sand area has to offer? Um because it is more than, than maths. Maths is absolutely part of it, but there's loads of understanding the world opportunities um, and lots of opportunities for language, vocabulary, literacy, early mark making as well. And that physical development, I think, Andy, is something that is really clear through sand play, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I think, um, I think the other thing to say as well is that at a time kind of as we are now in this sort of post covid world where actually you know every school pretty much up and down the country will be identifying the needs of the children on entry being very much around speech language and communication i think it is well worth us considering that sand areas provide a really rich context for talk you know both in terms of the sensory experience providing opportunities for for language development and and that that but also that collaborative play of children often, you know, being being around that sand tray, engaging together, playing alongside one another, um, having that eye contact across the sand tray. You know, it's a really collaborative experience and quite a social experience as well, I think. And and yet I think quite often when we talk about early years classrooms at the moment. And of course, space is of a, quite often of really of a premium, isn't it? And we've got to get such a lot into our spaces. Often sand areas are the first areas to go if we are, feel that we're short of space. You know, they're the first areas, one of the first areas that we move outside or into a, under a covered area. When actually, you know, I think, like you say, when you think about the, 
the breadth of possibilities in terms of speech, language, communication, mathematics, physical development, and so many other things, understanding the world, actually there's a good argument to say that a sand area could could be, or maybe should be, one of the first areas we keep in, not one of the first areas we take out, really, which is, I think is an interesting thing to consider because that's not usually the case. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as it, it's as part of that kind of room planning process that, that we do at Early Excellence. And um, I'm sure you've noticed this too, Andy, that often sand areas, if they do exist in, in early years, which often they do, um, they tend to exist outside. Um, and, and and that practice is seen as because actually it, it could be quite potentially quite messy, um, that actually that sensory play all happens outside. But it's like you say, actually, you know, if, if we're saying that it offers all of these key learning opportunities for children and and also we, we've not mentioned it, but it really does touch on on all of those characteristics of effective teaching and learning as well. Um, and those opportunities for children to make connections and look at kind of cause and effect and those sorts of things. You know, if we're saying that this is so important, which which we know it is, and, and things like language development being so important, then I think we've got to we've got to take a step back and think about where we showcase that in our provision. You know, are we offering children those opportunities to engage in learning through through kind of sand play? indoors as well as outdoors and that's not to say it doesn't happen outdoors we'd absolutely love to see large-scale sand play happening outside but opportunities for it to happen indoors as well I, I just think it's really powerful yeah definitely I mean, that is something that's well worth us just mentioning here even though the focus really of our conversation is is about inside sand I think it is important for us to just be clear that when people do move their sand outside that actually that's usually not a great way to do it. So just moving it kind of um, as it is, but moving it outside doesn't tend to work. You know, a sand tray outside kind of on legs, on you know, it doesn't really tend to work, you know, because for, for mo- much of the year, really, it's for much of the school year, of course, it's really not that warm to be standing still around a sand tray outside or a water tray for that matter you know that actually outside the benefit of being outdoors is that generally we've got more space and that the way to engage children outside is to really physically engage them and we don't get that through standing still at a sand tray Um, and so just trying to do that sand area by moving it outside doesn't tend to work I think it's important that we look at if we are looking at sand outdoors it really needs to be quite a large space that children can actually get inside and can dig properly, ideally with big spades, something different to what you've got inside, really, we would say. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you mentioned before, it's often one of the first things um, to to kind of get rid of if you haven't got space. Often, you know, schools, and, 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 and you know, it is difficult, isn't it, in early years, if, particularly if you've got a small classroom, um, to try and fit those areas of provision in. And often it is the first thing that that disappears, that, that sand area. Um, but it's like you say, we've got to be really careful that we don't just pick it up, pick up the indoor sand and put it outside and, and call that sand outdoor sand because it's very different. Um, but actually think of other ways that perhaps we could get sand into our provision. So um potentially looking at miniature sand you know sand in small trays sand on a small scale and I know this is something we talk often a lot about isn't it Andy in terms of key stage one practice um we often talk about sand being something that doesn't tend to really happen in key stage one much um it tends to be one of the first things to go there as well um and we'll always advocate for miniature sand because it offers real challenge to children, real physical challenge, um, but also that that scientific challenge as well, I think. And if you've got a small early years classroom or a small key stage one classroom, it's really well worth thinking about whether you can bring sand in on a, a smaller scale as well. Um, bring it in in miniature, use sand trays, little pots of sand, coloured sand perhaps, um, 
small resources that sit alongside that. You can get some fantastic small resources, can't you? Um, and is, is that something you've used, Andy, in, in kind of your practice? Yes, yeah. So I, I think it's always interesting to think about, particularly moving into case stage one, that idea of um, if we do go for miniature sand, then almost kind of turning a negative into a positive, like you say, that actually if we haven't got the room to have a sand tray, then have the miniature sand because actually we can then talk about how actually we've done that as a as a way of, of planning for the children, that it's, it's something that we've done intentionally because we're looking at um, refined skills. We're looking at smaller movements. Uh, we're looking at those fine motor movements that children need to develop, of course, and continue to need to develop into key stage one. So, yeah, absolutely. I've, I've certainly seen... Uh, and worked with schools who've done that really effectively. That those those smaller movements and making good use of smaller spaces for sand play. It doesn't have to necessarily be a big area. Um, it, you can do quite a lot with actually just the small surface space um, with different sand containers and the, the exploration around sand. Um, I mean, the other thing to say there is that if you are short of space within the classroom. Um, it does make sense to have a few smaller areas dotted around as well as as well as the larger areas that would be our kind of our priority areas. Because the smaller spaces will draw in one or two children at a time and just take the pressure off those other spaces around the room. You know, you don't want to just have, say, a, a blocks and small world area as, as important as that is, or a construction area, because those areas are always popular. And you'll end up with so many children within these spaces. Whereas having those areas plus some smaller spaces around those areas, providing little points of interest around the room will actually break up the numbers of children a bit more, I think, which tends to be easier to manage, really, and tend to lead to less logistical issues uh, within the classroom. So, yeah, it's certainly something to think about. So if people are thinking about sand within the classroom, within their early years or within their key stage one environment, then, of course, the first decision is, are we going to go for wet sand or are we going to go for dry sand? Um, just talk us through it, Luella. Um, are, there, are there reasons to go for wet sand rather than dry sand? Are there reasons to go for dry sand rather than wet sand? Is yeah. it a preference thing? What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, it's a good question, really. And I think it's often something that that is is you know when we talk to teachers about about sand play as part of our, our roles really uh, it's often something that crops up in conversation isn't it and often um people will say I've not actually really thought about it you know I've not really thought about why I only offer dry sand or why I only offer wet sand um but I think you know certainly if we've got the space to be able to offer both um would be fantastic it'd be a fantastic opportunity for children because both wet sand and dry sand offer very different learning possibilities don't they um and I think absolutely if you've got the space have both um and and kind of relish them for what they offer really I mean in terms of things like wet sand you're looking at opportunities there for lots of kind of physical skills you can obviously dig you can mold you can build with the wet sand you can mark make in wet sand um you can look at pattern print um there's a whole host of opportunities there within within wet sand just by adding water to that sand um and i think wet sand is often the one that we would say if you haven't quite got the space to have both then go for wet sand instead um, because dry sand, there are there's kind of a few properties of dry sand that's similar to water. So if you're going to have water and you've only got space for one sand area, then I would I would personally prioritise wet sand. Um, I don't know about you, Andy. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I'd agree. Yeah, I would always go for wet sand ahead of dry sand. Um, yeah, for the reasons that you gave, I think I think in terms of physical challenge, I think you get a lot more out of wet sand rather than dry sand. Um, but also, I, I just think you can do a lot more with it. You know, so in terms of moulding, shaping, making tunnels through it, creating imaginative worlds within it, um, as well as the kind of making marks and using tools 
there are there are I think a broader range of different things you can do with wet sand. I also think the other thing to say here is that practically it makes more sense as well. You know, the dry sand can go absolutely everywhere, can't it? You know, as we know, as early as teachers, you know, you put dry sand into a sand tray, it doesn't stay there that long, does it? You know, you get children who will be really playing with it and engaging with it, but it really does travel quite a bit. Um, whereas, of course, the wet sand doesn't do that in quite the same way. You, it, it is more practical. You don't have to spend quite a long tidying it up. Um, you do, of course, need to add in things like disinfectant to stop it sort of getting a bit smelly, you know, after a while. Uh, and you do need to change it over and clean it out. But actually, on a day to day basis, it actually is easier to manage, I think, really. So it is worth considering that, which is only a small point, I know. But actually, if if it's more, if it offers more learning possibilities and it's easier to manage, it's got to be the better thing, I would say. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think, so, so, uh, you know, if you can offer both, then you get that opportunity then to look at the properties within dry sand as well. But yeah, I'd absolutely think that that, that kind of wet sand would be your priority. Um, but then if you can have both, absolutely have dry sand as well, because it does offer those opportunities to look at or to look at the properties of dry sand as a, as a material and what it can do but also to look at the kind of scientific factors behind that, you know, looking at using things like sand wheels and exploring movement of sand and speed and force and those sorts of things, using natural materials within sand as well. Um, and I think dry sand is often a bit of a go-to because it, it feels like it's something that's that's always there it's always been done and I think when you talk to children about sand uh, I was having a conversation with a school um a while back now but we were talking about how children perceive the sand areas and what they do in the sand areas and we, we were actually having a conversation about the fact that you know children often see sand as dry sand they don't see wet sand necessarily as being sand from the off I think um so thinking about things like the beach I think you know on cartoons on the tv in storybooks and if children have visited beaches abroad um it might well be that they they see dry sand as the sand <laughs> the type of sand that that is recognizable to them um, but actually if you're to visit a beach in the UK um the sand that you're going to see on that beach in the UK is most likely to be wet sand isn't it and it, I suppose I suppose it's about what we kind of how we frame that to our children as well and the opportunities we offer within that play um, because children will gravitate towards dry sand and and you often see them don't you trying to make figure out how to make a sand castle out of dry sand <laughs> and watching it kind of tumble down um, and not realizing that actually adding water to it um, is what's going to make it stick and actually that that's what they do when they're on a beach is they tend to use wet sand but it's making those links really overt for children isn't it and that's why having dry sand and wet sand and and giving them those opportunities to explore two very different types of sand that have different properties and work in different ways and can be used in different ways. I think it's really powerful. Um, and I think as well, it's about thinking about how, how you manage that. Because like you say, if you do have dry sand, it can become a little bit unruly in the classroom, can't it? Sand everywhere, I think. Um, but just thinking about the practicalities of that, you know, having just pan and brush nearby, um, and showing children how to use those to look after that space and that area and having a dedicated shelf or a dedicated space where those sand resources are kept separately. So you've got your wet sand resources near your wet sand tray and your dry sand resources near your dry sand tray. Um, and they look quite different, don't they? Those the wet sand resources and the dry sand. There's some crossover, I think. You'd certainly have buckets in both spaces, wouldn't you? Um, but what are your thoughts there, Andy, around kind of resourcing those areas? Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, you, like you say, I think there are some areas where actually, uh, sorry, some resources that actually can be to some extent transferable, you know, like the buckets and, and other things, whereas other things that actually d just don't work. Um, so, for example, you could have water wheel, uh, you know, water or sand wheels 
within the dry sand area, as well as sieves, colanders. You want to see sand flowing through things, tubing, funnels, all of those sorts of things, um, which, of course, are great for, for within dry sand. But there's no point having them within your wet sand area. You know, they will just clog up within seconds, won't they? So there's no point having a, a sand wheel within the, the wet sand area. There's no point having colanders or sieves or all of those sorts of things. So they can, they can be removed straight away. And instead, really, what we need are a range of different tools. So things like um, different sorts of rakes, um, different sorts of scoops, moulds, of course, come into it because, of course, with wet sand, we can mould the, the sand in a different way. So different moulds, different containers for creating different moulds. We're going to be talking about capacity play still, but in a very different way, of course, because capacity play in, in dry sand and capacity play in water is very different to capacity play within damp or wet sand because, we, you know, we'll be, we'll be pressing the sand into it rather than scooping, pressing it down, seeing if we can get more into it, you know, filling it right up to the top and then making sure we've got a, a kind of a flat surface like you would do when you're making a sand castle. You know, that sort of capacity play, that exploration of capacity is different. We'd also want to explore shape as part of that as well, wouldn't we? You know, so that actually we want, if we're making a, a sand mould like a sand castle, then we, we would want to have different shapes from um, kind of more, more like a traditional bucket shape to then a cube or cuboid shapes that we can then that we can then add into the in, on, add into our sand tray. Um, so so that comes into it more as well. Um, and then the other thing alongside that, of course, is um, natural materials um, mm. in both dry sand and wet sand. I think so. So things things that particularly with wet sand, things that you can press into the sand. I think works really well. So things like sticks, driftwood, those sorts of things. Um, but also within within wet sand play, vehicles and other small world materials that will make tracks or that you can create interesting story settings within the wet sand area, within the wet sand tray. That particularly works well specifically around wet sand, I think. So yeah, there are some similarities, but also some some quite key differences too. I would say. Um, I was thinking actually, as we were just talking, um, Lu I wondered, Luella, what, have you? Can you think of a particular sand area that you have seen or where you've worked, where you think actually, you know, that's the kind of the the sand area that that I suppose sticks in your mind as being a particularly well resourced one or very well thought through sand area. Yeah, I'm, that? I'm just thinking now, actually, um, I saw a, a lovely sand area um, not so so long ago, actually, probably, I think it was this year, um, in a Leicestershire school, and it was lovely. Um, it They didn't have kind of a huge amount of space for wet sand and dry sand, but they, they kind of, when I was talking to the teacher, they really understood the reason for having both. Um, and they'd they'd kind of use the wet sand area as their main sand area. So they'd got a large tray with their wet sand resources. Um, and we actually had a really interesting conversation, Andy, about the use of plastic um, and how actually obviously that's quite a hot topic at the moment. And, um, you know, trying to bring natural materials into settings is is being seen as the way forward, being more sustainable. Um, but we had a conversation around plastics and we talked about how actually, if you're being realistic and not wasteful, um, thinking about robust plastics that will last a really long time to use for buckets and things in your wet sand area, it's going to be far better than kind of using natural materials that will degrade really quickly with wet sand uh, because of that water element and we were, we were kind of talking about that and what was interesting was when we went over to their dry sand area um, was that they had chosen to use something far more sustainable in that area where the water didn't have an impact because there wasn't any water in that space and they were using bamboo materials in that space um, which I just thought was a really smart idea <laughs> um, and really added to that that extra element for the children in terms of the feel of those materials as well, in contrast with the dry sand, um, which was really interesting. Um, and I think I, I just mentioned, didn't I, that the, 
the space wasn't overly big. So they'd kind of use the majority of that kind of space for the wet sand and the re- with the resources. And they'd got lots of natural materials going on in that space, but also kind of the buckets and the rakes and the molds and those sorts of things. But then the dry sand area, um, they had kind of used used the best space that they could find, really, which was um, they'd upcycled a treasure chest, like an old fashioned large treasure chest. And they'd used the box part of the treasure chest to store the dry sand materials in. And then, um, you know, the lid kind of curves in a in a treasure chest. Um, they'd folded that out and they'd used that as the sand tray, the dry sand tray, um, which meant it was on a lovely small scale. But it also meant that it could be kind of kept in a, in a contained space um, and the children were using it really, really well. And most children kneeled up to use it, which was added a really nice dimension as well in terms of the physicality of it all. Um, and again, they had mainly bamboo materials but they'd also used some metal materials in there where they'd used miniature resources so they'd got like miniature funnels miniature scoops um they thought really carefully about the types of small world they were adding into that space as well so they'd added in little wooden peg people so that the children could small world in that area Um, and they'd also thought about the types of small world animals or, or kind of people, small world characters that children would naturally use in those spaces. So they'd got in the dry sand area, I seem to remember they'd got things like um, a different variety of desert animals, you know, animals that would naturally be in the dry sand so that the children could use those to, to kind of role play in there, small world in there. Um, and then in the wet sand, They'd thought about animals and creatures that you would naturally you you would naturally be in wet sand. So dinosaurs was one of them. Um, And they had like little bird creatures um, that it it, it was just really well thought through. And I think that was the key, really, is that it wasn't just kind of a, oh, these are my sand resources. Let's just put them out on a shelf. It was a case of, okay, what lends itself to wet sand? what lends itself to dry sand and how can I make the most of a small area as well um, whilst offering both of those opportunities it it was a really lovely space and just really well thought through yeah no it, it sounds fantastic when I, when I think of the um the ones that have really sort of stuck in my mind I I, I think the best sand areas that I've seen are areas that have been Really well, again, like you say, really well thought through, really well organised, thought through in terms of materials and resources that are on offer. But I think also in addition to that, I think there are the spaces where the the staff, the earliest team have really thought about the kinds of questions and the children's curiosity and the, the types of discussions that can be prompted through the experiences within the sand area. So... For example, you know, the best areas that I've seen have, of course, you know, all of those things we've talked about, um, you know, this, the sand itself within the tray, you know, either wet or dry sand, as, as well as the, that range of materials and resources. But then also alongside that, they've really thought about what to display around that area that will get children talking, get them making links, getting them making connections, um, but also challenging misconceptions as well. You know, so I would, you know, I've seen settings that have done this really well where they've had things like um, photographs, really interesting photographs displayed within the sand area of sand in a range of contexts, you know, from sand on a beach to sand within a sand timer to, you know, wet sand and footprints in sand. To, um, to, you know, to sand in a, in a wide variety of contexts, but also challenging the conceptions of the children or misconceptions of the children. So, for example, you know, many children, in fact, probably most children wouldn't have seen um, sand that is a different colour. Whereas, of course, there are beaches, lots of beaches around the world where actually sand is not just a kind of a, a golden sand, typically, you know, that kind of colour, but that actually you might have black volcanic sand 
or you might have beaches that are not sandy at all. And, you know, that actually that's a challenge, isn't it? That, that for many children, they will assume that actually if we're talking about a beach, it's got to have sand on it. But actually that's not necessarily the case. So those sorts of photographs that will just make links or make connections, maybe you might have a, uh, if particularly thinking about whereabouts the school or setting is, you might have a beach that's nearby. And so therefore actually a photograph of that beach so that the children can talk about their experiences at that beach. You know, those sorts of different kinds of things that will, that are not just about what is being used in the space, but about helping the children to make links and make connections between the sand in this sand tray and the wider world, but also challenging conceptions around that and prompting conversations and discussions. So I, for me, those would be the sorts of things that I would want to see, I think, you know, in, in the best spaces. And those are the sorts of things that I have seen in the best sand areas when I've visited or, or with schools and settings that I've worked with. And I suppose, Andy, that comes full circle to what we were talking about right at the start, those kind of links to those learning areas for children and those learning opportunities and and coming right back round to communication and language again, isn't it? Getting children thinking, getting children talking. Um, and I think, you know, have, having those prompts there, those displays, those reminders, and, and things as well like fiction texts, non-fiction texts, um, things that that really challenge children's thinking. Um, I often think sounds a really interesting one because, and I think we've done it today, actually, we, you naturally gravitate to, to, towards talking about beaches and those sorts of things, don't you? Um, it's just a natural thing that children will do. But also you mentioned displays and and actually it's a great opportunity, isn't it, to to show children construction scenes as well and how sand is used in the construction world um particularly in the wet sand area um and offering up just like you said challenging those misconceptions and just really getting children thinking um sand offers all of those opportunities doesn't it yeah it does definitely yeah i wondered actually for people who are listening it would be quite interesting i think wouldn't it if people got in touch and kind of let us know because I'm sure there are people out there who have um, created sand areas in different ways using creatively using smaller spaces like you mentioned just before um, or maybe sort of using sand areas to challenge children's conceptions in the way that we've just been describing you know maybe through displays or making links or making connections so if you know if you have, if you've been listening along to the podcast and you think actually do you know what we've got a sand area that that encapsulates many of those different sorts of things, then do get in touch. It would be, it would be great to hear from you, um, whether that's on social media. So you can get in touch with us on, you know, on Twitter and on, on Facebook. You can get in touch with Early Excellence on Facebook. You can get in touch with us on uh, Instagram. In fact, I think we're pretty much on all of the different platforms. We're not on TikTok yet, which is probably a good thing, I should think. I, I don't think we're quite ready for TikTok, but... Um, but yeah, people can get in touch with us and it would be great to hear from you because I think I think it's always useful to share, to kind of share and share alike when it comes to early years practice. I, th I think it's always interesting to go and to see other people's practice, to see other people's environments. And so if actually people can use social media to do that, then that's brilliant. So yeah, do get in touch with us. It would be great to hear from you. Um, let us know how you're getting on with the sand area. And if you've got things to share in terms of that, that would be fantastic. So there you go, lots to think about there, I think. Um, I hope you found the episode useful. Um, thank you very much to Luella for joining us for this week's episode and, of course, also, also to you people for listening along as well. Um, if you access the podcast via the Early Excellence website, what we'll do is we'll add some useful links on there so that you can follow up the episode if you'd like to. Okay, so, uh, yeah, lots of information there that should help you carry things on. That's about it for this week, everybody. Thank you again for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.